Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us. We are waiting for folks to arrive, and we will start the session in just a few moments. If you've just joined us, you are in the right place. We are just waiting just a few more moments for everyone to successfully enter the session and then we'll go ahead and get started. Okay, on behalf of Alcock Marcus and SPS, we'd like to welcome you to our second interactive expert panel discussion on how to right size your condominium fee, where today we are specifically going to discuss how to calculate the gap between where your fee currently sits and where it should be. 
I'm going to introduce our panelists and get us started in just a moment. But before I do, I'd just like to take care of a few housekeeping items. All attendees have been added in listen only mode, but please do take the extra step of ensuring that your computer microphone is muted, please. We have about 30 minutes of panelist discussion planned for today, which allows us plenty of time to open up the conversation with all of you and hear what's really on your minds during our Q&A time. So as the discussion progresses, please feel free to submit any questions you'd like the panelists to address using that little Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. And again, these will be addressed after the panelists finish their discussion. We will be recording today's session and we're happy to share that recording with everyone uh, via email once it's available. And today's session is the second of three that we plan on hosting with these experts to really dig in on this topic of right-sizing condominium fees. And we do hope you will join us for the next session as well. So as we did in our first session, we have three experts with us today to really help us explore this question about condominium fees from various angles. Our first panelist is Norm Orban. Norm is a partner with a firm of Alcock and Marcus, and his sole focus is representing condominiums and homeowners associations in Massachusetts and Maine. He provides associations with general representation and with litigation matters in state and federal courts. He's been an active member of the CAI New England chapter since 2017, and he currently serves on the CAI New England's board of directors. We're also joined today by Ralph Noblin. Ralph is a professional engineer and a visionary entrepreneur with over 40 years of experience in the construction and building technology industry. He's the founder of Noblin and Associates and past president of CAI. His expertise lies in building envelope technology for condominiums and building repair and restoration. And our third panelist is Eric Churchill, Vice President at SPS, where he works closely with our clients and management team to deliver exceptional value and long-term solutions for condominium communities. Eric firmly believes in a comprehensive and collaborative approach to planning. He understands the importance of working hand in hand with board members, property managers and other professionals on behalf of communities and owners with the goal of ensuring that each community has an accurate, practical, realistic and actionable plan that meets their specific needs. So as we talked about in session one, there are factors that are often considered in determining the right monthly fee for communities. Typically communities look at things like homeowner affordability, what fees might be at nearby communities, what the operating costs are of the community, et cetera. This webinar series really discusses the factors that you absolutely must consider in order to have long-term and sustainable solution outcomes. And to do this, we recommend applying a best practice three-step planning framework to ensure that you're positioned to make a facts-based decision for your community. We started in session one by walking through collecting the necessary data so that we are armed with the facts. And today we're gonna to focus on step two of the process where we frame out what options we have and we make sure that we evaluate the benefits of each as well as what it would look like to execute them. Specifically today, we'll talk about calculating the fee and quantifying the gap. And we're anticipating this portion of this series will be quite a lively and eye-opening discussion. So with that, I'd like to hand it off to Norm to start us off with a discussion of the legal factors. Norm? Okay, good morning, everyone. And as Allison said, my name is Norm Orban, and I'm a partner at the law firm of Alcock & Marcus. So before we get into you know the fun part of this where we're dealing with math and calculations, just wanted to briefly touch on the, the importance of understanding the condominium boards or an HOA board's fiduciary duty to the condominium association as a whole. So Trustees or, or board members owe a fiduciary duty to the association to maintain, repair, and replace common areas. And part of this duty necessarily includes an obligation to look forward to future repair or replacement, which will be necessary at, at some point in time. It's always a matter of when, not if. We, we know no building is going to be sound forever. At some point in time, it's going to need some work. And part of the trustee's job is to 
figure out what that work is going to be, when it might happen, and how to put themselves both in a, a, a financial best place and just a practical ability to do this best place. And going hand in hand with this, it's the owner's expectations that this is what they've elected a board to do. And this is why these people or those board members have been elected to make sure that the condominium asset is protected now and will continue to be going forward in the future. Because like I said before, it's only a matter of when. And if this isn't done, if we only think of now, we don't think of the future, there could be significant harm to the association as a whole. You could have just loss in the form of damage to the common areas or the loss could expand if the common areas fail to individual units. It also could turn into some significant board liability if there's an idea that they knew or should have known about the need for doing some repairs and the failure to go ahead and go forward with them. And it could make it very difficult for the association or for any unit owners or future unit owners to obtain funding for their association for a variety of different ways or a variety of different reasons. So it's important to understand that there is this obligation by a board to make sure that adequate steps are taken to repair the common areas today and going forward into the future. Um, and, and before we move on, we, we do have a, a brief poll we're gonna introduce to you guys just to help us maybe lead the question and answer period later or to help us with any, any follow-up. Okay, thank you, John. This is uh, Ralph Noblin, consultant. Uh, good morning. Uh, reserve studies identify and quantify common property that the board needs to consider when creating a financial plan. We talked about that in our first webinar. It is absolutely critical that a property property reserve study be an active working document and not something to be stuffed in a desk drawer. Let's discuss cost estimating. Reserve studies provide replacement cost estimates for common property elements, which is a good point to start the discussion. Discussions move forward further defining projects. For example, roofing and our siding and our windows and doors and our decks. Then there's pavement and our curbing and our sidewalks and our retaining walls and our tennis courts, fencing, lighting, septic, swimming pool, parking garage, elevators, hallway upgrades, HVAC, and possibly many more. Uh, you'll hear talk about mobilization and demobilization. We call it mob demob, getting set up and then breaking down at the end. Design and project administration by an architect or an engineer, significant factor in the discussions. Project coordination by management. Management has to get the notices out, has to deal with the contractor, with the architect engineer, with the homeowners. Historically, reserve studies did not usually include all of the actual costs associated with common property management. How about other real issues? Scheduling. Think New England weather, yikes. Uh, disruption, to, uh, disruption to community, think paving. Saturdays, often critical for a contract to, to get done in a reasonable time when all these other factors, particularly weather, have, have uh, worked against him. Warranties, back when many condominiums were built, warranties, for example, roofing and siding, were not always pursued. They were not a high priority by developers. In my opinion, warranties are well worth pursuing when these things are done. Today's webinar is all about moving from construction facts to figures. And with that, I'll turn this over to Eric Churchill. Just wait for a second for people to take that, uh, to take that poll. Uh, the, these poll questions are valuable to us in terms of being able to uh, guide and focus our answers to questions and as Norm suggested to the uh, to the follow up um, and also helping us to best position uh, the third part of this series. Okay, so um, hopefully everyone's had to take the had time to uh, to take that poll. Um, thank you, Allison, uh, Norm, and Ralph. 
Uh, just before we talk about calculating the fee, just want to emphasize one of the things that Ralph talked about, which is the, the value of the reserve study is a reserve study does provide uh, really important information in terms of the life expectancy, the useful life of specific common area components and the replacement costs. As Ralph suggested, um, it, it does not always include all of the costs. And so using a reserve study as a basis for, for planning is a great start. And then taking time to uh, ask the question, is anything missing? So that when we get into the numbers, the numbers are complete and the plan um, that we're talking about is, is based on uh, hard and actual facts. So uh, calculating the fee, this is, this is obviously a, uh, a topic um, for every community. What should the condominium fee be at our community? Um, I wanna start by, by, by acknowledging that every community is different. And the fee at every community will be different. The costs are different. Um, the amenities are often different. So what we've done is we've taken just a base fee. Uh, we're gonna use $550 as an example. Um, and we're going to dissect that a little bit and talk about uh, the different approaches to evaluating uh, the, the accuracy of that fee with respect to covering all of the expenses that the community faces. So a couple of different ways to set fees. Uh, there's a common practice where uh, a lot of communities are, are focused on keeping the fee the same every year. Um, we're, not gonna, we're not gonna talk about how to calculate that because it's pretty simple. You leave it the same. The, we will, uh, I do just pose the question that if you keep the fee the same, um, what expectation does anyone have that you're gonna keep up with, with inflation? Um, a second approach is to pick just a standard increase to the fee. So take the base fee and just increase it a percentage, maybe adjusted by the cost of living or a percentage that uh, the community embraces. Again, pretty simple math. So we won't get into the details of that. Uh, the next two we're gonna look at a little more carefully. Um, one is a common practice where the operating expenses, which are generally known, represent uh, ninety percent of the total fee, and then there's and ten percent is a contribution to reserve. That was a best practices guideline for a long, long period of time. We'll look at that calculation, and then we'll look at a more comprehensive calculation that includes um, reserve study expenses. Um, again, I want to acknowledge that that every every community is unique, and there's there are many uh, many other ways to set fees beyond uh, the examples that we're going to talk about today. So in terms of looking at uh, a percentage-based approach, um, many of you may have heard in the past people say, you know, it's, it's good to put 10% of your total fee into reserves. Um, that comment and that approach is not usually grounded in the reality of what those capital expenses are. It's just a guideline. And it's a guideline that I think that we, that we have seen has caused some challenges because 10% is not necessarily, uh, does not necessarily correlate with the cost uh, associated with the capital replacement of all the items listed in the reserve study. Um, that said, this is a, a simple way to calculate a fee. If we look at that on a, on a pie chart, uh, we can look at the, on the right-hand side here, we have the $550, that's the condominium fee. On the left side, we have $500 in operating expenses. Those are the known expenses that occur year in and year out. And then the additional $50 going into reserves. So you can see that chart is nicely balanced. We've got revenue coming in of 550 and revenue account, and then the expenses accounted for of 500 for operating and 50 going into the reserves. The question is, is that enough? So when we go drill down one more level uh, and start looking at what are the actual costs versus just using a, a guideline of 10%, we've created another example here. So you notice the operating expenses have not changed. They remain the $500. 
based on the reserve study that uh, Ralph refers to and taking into account everything that's in that reserve study, we've created a scenario here where $300 per owner per month adequately funds the, the, uh, the need for uh, cash to pay future expenses as indicated by the reserve study. And in this case, we also then have an additional uh, 10% or $90 that goes into reserves for the unexpected. Ralph mentioned a few things that may not be accounted for, and then you also have uh, unexpected expenses. So you add the three of those together, and in, in this scenario, you come up with a fee of $890. So if we look at this pie chart, it looks a little different. The $550 is no longer half, meaning the $550 doesn't equal the total of the expenses. And so uh, if we go to the next table, or the here, what we've done is just the simple math of taking the $890, which accounts for everything, minus the 550, and we've defined the gap, which is $340. So if we look at this, uh, this pie chart, you can see that the 550 plus the 340 gives us half, or the revenue aside of the equation, which then would equal the expense side of the equation, which is the 500 plus the 90 plus the 300 that we that was associated with funding the reserves. So as you think about this uh, this poll question, um, just what I want to I just want to reiterate that uh, looking back at, at right sizing the condominium fee, we've taken one example and just walked through the process of asking questions, is everything accounted for? And um, we'll wait for the answer to this poll, and then we will move to uh, Q and A. Okay, great. I see some some questions coming in. So I do want to thank all three of you. That was a really great discussion on step two of the recommended process. Norm, we learned a lot about how to think about the fee in terms of fiduciary responsibility. Ralph, thank you as always for your discussion about what a reserve study should and shouldn't be and how it should factor into the forecasting process. And Eric, as always, that was a really thorough review of all the different processes for calculating the fee and how those impact our gap. Um, again, we do hope that you'll join us next month for the third and final session in the series where we'll cover step three, which focuses on creating a plan. Uh, but in the meantime, we are gonna open it up for some questions. Norm is here to answer legal questions. Ralph can provide insight on technical questions and Eric can address the financial and math questions. Okay, so let's look here. So first up, um, question for Eric. Um, in the slide just presented, is the column called reserve fund a contingency fund? Where is the money being put into reserves for expected but future capital and maintenance items identified by the reserve study? Uh, great question. Maybe we could scroll back a few slides and look at that. Uh... Okay, uh, go, let's go forward one more, two, one more to the pie. There we go. So uh, great question. And one of the things we like to, to think about is the difference between the reserve uh, fund requirements that are known versus those that might be unknown. So in the case here, the, the $340 gap um, accounts for both of those. So if we look at the $300 um, in that blue, in that dark blue slide, is the amount needed to fund the capital plan as indicated by the reserve study. So that that would be classified therefore as a fully funded reserves, reserve plan. The $90 is an additional amount 
Uh, one, in case there are some operating expense overruns, for example, if you had you know excess snow and you didn't have a fixed snow contract, uh, if there was any variability there in plowing or some other expense that was unexpected. The $90 and the fund that that, that, that builds could also fuel uh, a timing discrepancy in the reserve study. So your reserve study has um, both a uh, an amount, a cost of something, and a time that it expects for that replacement. So let's take septic, for example. If you were planning $200,000 for a septic replacement in 2030, and you had a septic failure in 2028, you would need additional funds uh, earlier than you had planned. That's what that additional um, uh, reserve, extra reserve fund is for. Hopefully that answers uh, Paul's question. Thank you. Here's another one. Um, when we have a study that shows major projects in 25 years, how much of this should be funded in current fees and how much later on by special assessments? There's probably two sides to that. Maybe Norm, you have a, a quick some insight into that, and then yeah, there is definitely a uh, financial planning side of that as well. Yeah, I mean, I, I think there. I mean, I agree with the two sides. I'm hoping we're, we're our, our two sides are going to be similar in that. You know, I, I think it could be there, there's sort of a balanced approach where I, I think you should always be contributing something for it. I think there's a real argument that you should just be filling it up as you go. That way, there is no major special assessment down the road. Um, but there's certainly some utility or understanding to say, okay, we're going to do X amount instead of the, the full amount we need to fund this 20 years from now. And that when we get there 20 years from now, yes, we'll have this, this special assessment, but we'll, we'll create different sort of options to repay that. So it doesn't come as, as such a heavy hit, maybe part re refinance, part pay in full. There's different ways to do it. I don't know that there's necessarily a wrong way as long as you're you are taking some steps i think maybe the only wrong way is contributing zero to it um is how i would look at it so it's as long as you're preparing and because i there there is utility to both sides of it um as long as you know and understand and i think the goal should be we don't want to have this gigantic assessment down the road we want to make it so it's as reasonable as we can by also making things a little lighter during the the process if that's the approach you're going to take yeah, and I'll just add to that. If, uh, can we go back one slide to the slide with the tree? There, this slide. So um, this question to me uh, gets at the, uh, the question of where does the money come from? And money comes from either saving money um, <laughs> or assessing owners at the time the money is needed. So saving money in terms of building reserves, assessing owners at the time the money is needed or planning to finance and the money then comes from a bank. Um, we know the money doesn't come from a money tree. Um, so that's why we vexed that out. The um, So the decision uh, to, for how to plan for something that is a large project in 25 years, I think Norm's point is, let's make the decision today. What is the plan? Are we going to save for that? Are we going to plan to assess owners and maybe alert them well in advance so that they can be prepared? Or are we going to plan to borrow the money at the time? And if so, how do we how do we best plan for that? So that it isn't a surprise. It's part of a plan. And there, in this case, I think all three of those represent, all three of those approaches represent um, perfectly acceptable approach to planning. Thank you. Ralph, this is directly related to your portion of the presentation, but I suspect Eric will want to maybe weigh in here as well. The question is, can you expand upon a reserve study being live or dynamic? Isn't it just a 50-page written report? It is. It's a lengthy report, tons of photographs. Uh, we did hundreds of them over the years, and we always took a lot of photographs because at meetings, I would have people tell me our pavement is fine, our decks are fine, and the photographs usually counted that argument. Um, yeah, I want to stress that if we go all the way back to the Condominium Act, okay, the condominiums must maintain adequate reserves. And that's, that's the exact wording. We joked about that in the 80s, well, what the heck does adequate really mean? 
Um, in my world, I'm a numbers guy. In my world, it's okay. We figured the roofs, and in the 80s, roofs were 20 air items pretty much. In the 90s, they went to 30 air items pretty much. Now you can have roof shingles in the last 50 years. Um, so you have to get into the specifics of <clears throat> exactly what we have, what we project for the remaining use of life. And, you know, we're experienced people uh, in looking at these items, but it's not an exact science. That's why the industry way back talked about updating these studies every five years. Then they even went to updating these studies every three years uh, because numbers will change. And Eric can tell you before COVID versus after COVID, wow, it, it, it's like a night and day difference. So it absolutely is a document that starts the discussion. Yes, we have shingle roofs. Yes, those shingle roofs are going to wear out in a certain amount of time. Um, you can do Excel spreadsheets to determine, okay, how much should we be setting aside for those roofs so that when that day comes, when we all acknowledge, yes, the roofs are now leaking, they're in, in terrible shape uh, aesthetically and otherwise, it's time to do it. The money is there to do it. Um, for some of the older communities that have gone a long time and now have a, a sizable gap, financing does make perfect sense. For those brand new condominiums, I hope that the discussions are more serious now than they were 10, 20, 30, or 40 years ago as far as what should the number really be. And are we missing something, okay, as a, um, a portion of the total? So yes, it's absolutely a dynamic document. I frankly think it should be discussed at an open meeting every single year after the board has, has a good chance to thoroughly digest the document and become familiar with it. Yeah, I'll just add a little tidbit to that, which um, I think what, what you hear Ralph saying is, yes, historically reserved studies are reports that are snapshots as things have changed over time. Uh, we and Ralph, I think Norm, all three of us would advocate for reserve studies being fluid. They should be live documents updated annually with actually what happened, what has changed over the course of that year and how that uh, those changes impact the plan going forward so that plan revisions can be made on an annual basis. I want to uh, just, uh, there was one question that came up uh, Gentlemen, uh, Jeff, uh, why is snow plowing in the reserve contribution, not the operating expense? That that was, um, since I think that stemmed from my comment. Uh, so in the case of that last scenario where the $300 was allocated to funding the reserve study, the additional pie slice of $90 and the fund that that created, I think should be looked at a little differently than just thinking of it as reserves. It's the rainy day fund. And so it's not necessarily specific to reserves or specific to operating expenses, but it's an additional amount of money that you have available um, to offset anything that's a that that's a surprise, whether that was an operating expense surprise or a reserve expense surprise. In the case of snow plowing, that is an operating that that would be commonly considered an operating expense. And so maybe related to that, Eric, is a, a separate question that was submitted. Our condominium typically pays for exterior maintenance, such as holes in the siding and painting out of that reserve balance. Is that correct? Should it be a budgeted expense? And what's the difference? Yeah, so this is where um, if we had the account on, you know, as part of the panel, the fourth piece here, this is where we would talk about there are accounting rules. And then there is just uh, from my, you know, from our perspective, sort of common sense planning. And so when we think of planning, um, if you think of planning as a cash flow plan, and we just park the accounting rules for a minute, which you, they need to be followed, so they can't be parked permanently. But if we just think of, of planning as a cash flow plan, then we can, that allows us the flexibility to look at things and say, we have X dollars coming in, and we have Y dollars going out, and X needs to be greater than Y or else we're spending more money than we have. And regardless of what where that money goes, whether it's to a capital project, to an operating expense, to an unforeseen expense, um, it's from a cash perspective, we need to have that balance. 
historically what happens is we communities collect money, they pay the bills they have to pay, which are generally the operating expenses. And then if they have leftover money, they pay for additional, maybe some, some capital projects. We're advocating, let's change that to uh, being more of a proactive plan than sort of a reactive and leftover plan. Hopefully that hopefully that helps explain that. Yeah, l let me add to that, Eric, that historically the IRS has viewed items like painting as maintenance items, not reserve items, and it could kind of contaminate, if you will, the reserve fund. Um, but it's a real consideration when you look at, for example, a wood-sided complex that's now older, the, the wood is failing, each paint job gives you less satisfactory results than the one before it. Um, if you were to change to vinyl siding, which has happened in many condominiums, you pretty much eliminate that painting every six years, seven years. So that item goes off <clears throat> the operating budget and you, know, you, you now look at the reserve budget in a different way. So uh, you're right, it's all money, but there are specific IRS considerations that you should make sure you're in agreement with your accountant for the association that you have items in the right category. Great. Here's a specific scenario someone's looking for some feedback on. My HOA has a gap of $7,055 between 2024 estimated budget versus annual income. So the gap is $7,000. We agree that if our 2024 estimated expenses are more than $5,000, we will take that amount from our reserve and special assess any amount over the $5,000. We currently set aside 10% of monthly income into our reserve account. This was done to keep our fees the same since 2020. Your thoughts? Uh, so first of all, um, uh, I applaud the uh, the the, uh, the thinking and the approach there, and that that's a great question. Um, it's a very difficult to answer with just the 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 data provided here. My thoughts are that we that you take an approach of looking very carefully at what your operating expenses are. Those should be relatively easy to identify and predict. On top of that, if you have a reserve study, you can use, use, use the reserve study for information. If not, potentially you get one and or consult with some experts to understand what additional costs are, what, they, what, what your expected additional costs are. And then make sure that you are collecting annually instead of it being just a 10% number, you're collecting the money that is needed to pay for the operating expenses and to plan according to whatever plan you have uh, for the capital project expenses. So I think difficult to answer um, really succinctly, uh, perhaps a good follow-up question for either a small group session or for our, our planning, uh, our active planning session in the, uh, in the next webinar. Great. Here's another one. Um, the condo fee discussion is always popular. Why is it up to a revolving door of board members? Isn't there some sort of regulation so it keeps communities from fighting? It causes so much angst among neighbors. Yeah, I'm gonna let Norm Norm talk about the, uh, the legal. Yeah, and, and, and I think this there's another question about how to how to deal with pushback from from owners that I'd sort of think kind of goes hand in hand with this. The way the way the statute and, and condominium law works is the board is responsible for to maintain, repair, and replace the common areas. And, and there's case law that it says that basically if you don't like what the board is doing, you need to use the vote and kick them out. So it's up to it's sort of the majority's will to elect these people and then have them and trust in them to do what they're supposed to do. Um, I think it, at basically any association, no one loves a giant increase in any fees. And, and I think the way to, to make it work the best way possible is you got to be open and honest and tell them what's going on in the process as, as best you can. There may be some things you need to kind of keep closer to the, the vest for the time being. But you have to say, hey, we had this study done. 
look, if there's going to be a large amount of um, an assessment. We're looking into figure out different way. And, and at every step of the way, you ne need to let them feel like they're hurt. In the end, it's up to the board to ultimately decide. Um, but I think the only way to make it work, and in the end, no one might be happy because no one wants to pay the extra money, but to be open, to be honest, to show them, to walk them through. And, and it can be difficult because every community is different. You know, I, I find it, it's especially hard uh, where you have a situation where it's a, a more investor or a half and half resident, you know, people that live there or investor that rent their units because the renters aren't going to want their, their increase to go up because they don't live there. They don't deal with it. So it, it's difficult at every single level, but the only way to be successful is to be clear and to be fairly open about it and say, this is what it is. And, and this is what the statute provides. And this is why you elected us. I'll add the the business side of those. The, I think there's a legal side of that that uh, that Norm's you know um, given some framework to the the business side of that is um, it is a great question. The board is being asked to do a very difficult task, and the boards do change over. What could be the constant is your financial plan. So instead of having a reserve study, instead of having an annual budget. If you have an actual financial plan that the community, that is transparent to the community, that the community is aware of, and that that plan, by working with your attorney, your accountants, with contractors, with reserve study firms, that plan is fully funded. And if it's not, the planned assessments are identified when they're going to happen. If there's full transparency to all of that, then you're basically taking the facts as they're known the operating expenses and the capital cost expenses, you're accounting for all of them, you're creating a plan and you're following the plan. That way, when boards turn over, their job is to follow the plan, maybe to revise it, maybe to look at it carefully, but they're not, they're not just starting from scratch as a new board and saying, okay, we're going to do it this way. And that continuity over time builds financial stability. It builds value in the homes. It builds community. You know, it it it, it helps to uh, eliminate uh, dissension within the community and uh, conflict within the community. Um, so, Norm used the word, you know, transparent and be open and honest. Be open and honest about the actual costs of running the running the community and share that with the with the community. Thank you. We have a couple of questions here about specific categorization of expenses um, that I'd like us to talk through. The first one is, how does the board know what is a capital expense? For example, is painting a building that costs $25,000 considered a capital expense? Okay, I'll yeah, touch on that. As, as I mentioned earlier, this is a subject that has been going on for decades. Because painting usually in your twenty-five thousand dollar figure um, is very common. Frankly, two hundred thousand dollars for larger complexes is not unusual. Um, right or wrong, the IRS has made that decision. It's an operating budget type item, so it's not a reserve budget type item. Even though it might dwarf in dollars some of the items that are on the reserve schedule, so it, the numbers are real. And I think this whole discussion revolves around talking about this issue more rather than less. It is an uncomfortable discussion. Believe me, I've attended many meetings. You have you know, some people in the crowd who are on fixed incomes. They didn't you know, know at the time uh, how the whole condominium act plays out and you know how we had people tell us in 1987, Ralph, I'm here for a couple of years. I'm gonna buy a house in the suburbs, I'm all set. Then in 2017, we're talking to the same condo owners. <laughs> oh, geez, yeah, we, we ended up staying. So the time passes quickly. The numbers um, change quickly. Uh, the earlier comment about a 2020 study, frankly, it's not relevant in 2024. Absolutely. <clears throat> from a category standpoint, it might be adequate. But from a, an actual dollar standpoint, it's not. So I think these discussions need to take place more often in the open, open discussions with homeowners, they need to understand what they can vote for, what they can't vote for. And, you know, what are the numbers, particularly as you get closer to the construction? Yeah, if the construction is 25 years off, 
okay, is not as pressing as if the construction is in 2025. Um, so let's talk about this more at open meetings. You know, I think to touch on some of the, the, the idea, what the reserves are supposed to be for is to replace, restore, or rebuild common areas. That, that, that's what their, their goal is. So when you're doing that type of replacement type work is when you would expect to be using um, the reserve funds. So to replace, restore, rebuild common areas is what the reserves are targeted for. Great. Thank you. Um, here's a question about guidelines and size of communities. Do the guidelines for fee adjustments apply to small condominium projects, say two to six units? And is there, if so, is there any modifications in that process or the objectives? So I think the, um, the guideline of figuring out actual costs and then planning for them, that guideline I, I think survives whether it's a small community up to, you know, we work with communities that are over 500 homes. Um, so that guideline uh, would apply across the board. Um, when you're looking at costs on a per home basis, that's the way to kind of sanity check and and to look at things uh, equally from community to community, whether they're larger or smaller. Um, the challenges with smaller communities, you've got you've got fewer owners, and um, so you've got a more intimate environment, and uh, oftentimes that creates uh, some hurdles that we've seen. Here's an interesting one that I know that we've all um, heard about this struggle many times. Our condo fee is $400 a month. Our property manager tells us that's too low for our property. Owners don't want to increase it. Many owners are submitting requests to remove trees and fix curbs and paving. So how do we do both? That that's the best that's the that's just such the great question because <laughs> that's the norm that's the reality of of condominium living is is you're spending common money and people have different preferences for how the money is spent even even on the on the common elements and so some people someone might prefer that a tree is removed and someone else might prefer that the that the driveway that the that the road is repaired or that the building is is painted or restored so this is where um, I think we collectively, all of us that are connected to the condominium world, um, need to do some hard work and, and work together as a group, um, as owners, as board members, as service professionals, um, to have better communication, more awareness of what things cost, uh, more discussion on prioritizing uh, different elements, better understanding of what things impact the value of your home versus what things might not, what things impact financing, what things, you know, what things don't. Um, there just needs to be more open discussion on this, more transparency and and greater effort and commitment put into into the planning process so that those questions can be answered and planned for. Great. Norm, here's a question uh, I think you'd be best to kick us off with. Uh, with at least 25% of units affordable under Massachusetts law, how does that affect condo fees? Owners often buy and don't even know they are affordable units with regulated lower fees. We've seen anger from owners that feel they are carrying the burden. Yeah, and I think that's a, a difficult process. Um, it's all it's all subject to what your master deed says about the percentage interest because often when you have an affordable unit despite whatever the size may be the ultimate percentage interest is often reduced or, or changed because of the affordable nature of it um and, and that's how the, the fees would be calculated and as much as I, I appreciate maybe not understanding it it's part of what you should be looking into when you're buying a condominium it's part of the master deed it's something that you should be worked with your your realtor or, or, or your closing attorney that, that should be part of it you know, unfortunately, you're buying into that that structure when you're buying into a condominium with with the affordable housing in it, because it will change the percentage interest they have and what they have to pay versus what everybody else has to pay. 
Thank you. Eric, here's a question for you. Um, if painting is done every so many years, the operating budget may need to include some contribution to painting that is not spent every year. That's why I think some associations want to put this in the reserve fund. Nonprofit associations must balance to a must manage to a zero balance budget every year. What is your suggestion in this situation? So that that's a really another really good question. Um, that is specific enough that I think we table that for um, for an accountant resource. Uh, you've asked, you've covered all the right, you've asked all the right sort of pieces to that question. It sounds like you have a, a really the the uh, the person has a really good understanding of what the issues are. That is a difficult thing to answer. Uh, your accountant is definitely the best resource because the answer might be different from community to community. Um, and we are committed as a group here to to add uh, an accountant component to this expert panel um, so that questions like that could be answered, you know, in real time. Um, so I, I apologize. I don't have the answer to that question. Um, we will incorporate it in our follow up and and get you an answer. Here's a simple question. Can you help with projecting budgets into the future? Uh, absolutely. You know, I think uh, what what we have uh, what we have committed to over the last ten years is developing uh, modeling that is easy to use, accurate, um, and a really valuable tool for looking at medium, short, medium, and long term planning, um, incorporating live modeling. Um, that's very accessible to board members and and easy to share with owners. I think is 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 a great first step there. Okay, and then sort of a, a related question for someone who says their community was built over a twelve year period, and so it seems like they're going to have to plan for rolling expenditures for something like roofing or potentially even roads. And the question is, do you have the ability to plan for a rolling capital replacement? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Ralph, you've seen that a lot. Why don't you give your insights there? Yes. I mean, when you do your funding and, and look at the Excel spreadsheet, there's a couple of different ways to do it. Um, with this type of situation where it's been phased over a long period of time, Essentially, you want to have the contributions sufficient enough so that at any given time, 2033, 2037, you have the money to do the projects in that project year and the subsequent years after that. So it's, it's actually a fascinating program when you put in all the categories, there might be as many as 30 items, all with different um, remaining useful lifetimes to come up with amounts that generally a, a gradually uh, increasing each year due to inflation, okay, to cover the roofs that have to be done in 10 years, then the roofs that have to be done in 15 years, the pavement that might have been done in phase one at the start of the project and then phase four 10 years later. So yes, that absolutely can be done. But again, it's not, you know, people are going, no, no, we, you know, it, they're real numbers, okay? I, I have to stress the documents are real, the numbers are real, and yeah, they're daunting, absolutely no question. They they should be analyzed, absolutely. They should, from a legal standpoint, from an accounting standpoint, from an engineering standpoint, you, you want, when you have these discussions, to be absolutely rock solid. Because yeah, there might be one cynic or two cynics in the obvious, in the audience, that are going to try to, you know, attack a certain number or a certain procedure that they don't like or they don't agree with. So yeah, it, it can be done. Great. We have just a few more minutes and I want to save space at the end for a common theme that's kind of arose here. But first we have a question. Um, replace, restore, rebuild. What about enhancing? Examples are improving the community by adding an EV charger. It's permanent. The complex doesn't have mailboxes and many owners want to add a mailbox estimated at $10,000. Permanent improvements can't be funded from the reserves. 
Yeah, you would normally not see that being public by the excuse me funded by the reserves. However, the way an improvement would normally work is you'd need to get a certain seventy five percent unit owners to approve it. Then it becomes a common area assessment. From then, once it becomes you know a, a part of the common area, I think that the future maintenance. Or, or replacement and repair of it could be something that would be part of that be funded by the reserve, but the initial improvement wouldn't be something you would expect it to see in a reserve study because that's sort of looking at what you currently are and how to best prepare to fund any future projects or, or, or repairs to that. Okay. So we have quite a few folks who are you know, asking questions about insurance premiums. It seems like we have some communities that were surprised by fee increases. One is noting an increase of 32%, someone saying 150% increase. And the question is really around how are we expected to plan for surprises like this? Uh, some folks took it from the reserves and also had to increase the fees, but it basically just caused an additional increase in the budget and the condo fee. So how, what are some strategies for addressing um, these unanticipated additional costs? And, and, and Eric, and this might be something great for you to think about unexpected costs, but with insurance in, in particular, I, I just wanted to make a, a general comment that we're in the condominium world. And I think overall, we're sort of in the midst of an insurance crisis that I don't know that we really could have anticipated it getting to where we are. Because um, it's a situation where, as a board, you have a duty to make sure you have insurance, but it's getting harder and harder to get. So I mean, that, that's a, a, probably an entire webinar or multiple on its own with the situation that we're in with, with insurance. So I, I do want to say, you know, that's something right now is, is something that's a problem. And it, it, at this point, it's becoming a known problem. And it might be something that everybody needs to think about how to be prepared in the event that does happen to you. Um, but I, I think, you know, in general, Eric may or, or Ralph may have some ideas about, quote, unquote, the, you know, the unknown um, that could come up at any point in time. Well, I think Eric touched on this a little bit earlier as far as uh, snow plowing, for example. Um, you know, it should be a miscellaneous category in the operating budget for surprises you know, which could be anything, including a big bump in the insurance. Yeah, I'm, I'm down here in Florida and the insurance market is absolutely crazy because of what has happened and no one could anticipate that. But moving forward, I think there should be a certain amount set aside for miscellaneous. And even at that, it, 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 the insurance hurdle is a tough one to overcome. So um, I, I think you obviously need to shop around you need to look at the company's track record. Um, quite a few have gone out of business here in Florida. Uh, so it's, it's a complicated issue. Um, I defer to, to Norm as far as, you know, legally, what can they, you know, uh, put in this, quote, special category. But <laughs> yeah, it, the rainy day fund, absolutely, you need to have something there. Yeah, and I'll, I'll add, uh, I'll add, uh, three, there's three elements to me that are sort of embedded in this question. Um, and they all revolve around reducing risk. So um, you have insurance and or other related, you know, variable expenses. You have financing, which we've talked about both the community's ability to finance um, and individual owners' ability to get financing for their homes and you have home values. So we take those three things, and if you are constantly uh, asking yourself as you make a plan, so part of your planning process is question number one, are we reducing risk from the perspective of insurance companies? That will help your insurance premiums. Two, are we reducing risk from the perspective of banks, whether it's homeowner first mortgages or association loans so that we have accessibility there's accessibility to financing are we increasing the value of our homes so that we're increasing uh the equity uh of the you know for each of the individual owners if you're constantly asking those questions about those three topics uh risk financing and home value as part of your plan you will i think strengthen the community and help uh, preserve lower insurance rates, opportunity for financing and higher home values. 
Wonderful. We are at time. Um, I know we have questions still coming in, but please know that we will um, circle back and make sure that all of these questions get answered in one way or another. Look for more information from us on that. I do want to thank you all for attending. This concludes the session and please do stay tuned for the recording from this discussion today, as well as for an invitation to the next session in the series, which is scheduled for Wednesday, February 28th. Thank you all so much. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you all. Thanks everyone.